Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to our November Sip Scout party. Whiskey time. Whiskey time. Yes. As you uh, settle in there, uh, as you might see, we've got our whiskeys all poured out here. Um, it's nice to be able to go back and forth and taste through these whiskeys kind of at your leisure. And if you only have one glass, that makes it a little hard. So if you got a few glasses, this is what we'd recommend. Yep. And they don't have to be these fancy Glencairns if you don't have them. Although we do highly recommend them if you're, They're into, nice. if you're into whiskey, getting a couple of these is, is very nice. Um, but if you have, you know, wine glasses actually work quite nice. Um, yep. You know, something that has a little bit of a, a shape to it um, versus just kind of, you know, but small water glasses will do as well. Yep. Um, we've also got a little dropper here of distilled water. Um, getting to add a little water while you're trying through these whiskeys can really change the profile of them and maybe illuminate some things that you didn't realize were there before. Um, it can be kind of a revelatory experience. So we'll give people a couple of minutes to settle in, join, and then we're going to get started. I'm going to put our tasting order in here so you can get set up like we are. <coughs> We're going to start with our pork cask Irish whiskey. Oops, I'm spelling whiskey wrong. Need, need my glasses, need my glasses. <laughs> uh, then we've got a pretty fun thing that we're excited to kind of talk with you guys tonight about. Uh, this is the American Single Malt from Boulder Spirits. That's going to be the second one that we're tasting. Um, and then we're going to follow that one up with our baby blue, the mm -hmm. corn whiskey from Balcones. And then we will move into Fort Mose, the bourbon. Need a little accent on Fort Mose. <laughs> they look good work. It always takes me like three attempts uh, at the ASCI code. Where's everyone joining from tonight? Feel free to unmute yourselves chat with us a little bit while we're getting started here and then doubled and twisted <clears throat> and then last but certainly not least are the roundstone rye. rye from good old Catoctin creek yes so that is the order we will be tasting in tonight we would love it if we um, if you would chat with us back uh, and you can do that on the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on the chat here where I just put the tasting order in there. Um, nice to see the Sip Scout box over there. We're excited for people who have it. <laughs> there may be some people joining tonight who don't have the Sip Scout box. We had quite a few people register, so they may be joining a little later and that is totally okay. Um, you know, you can pour yourself whatever you have on hand as well and join in on the fun and yeah. maybe get teased and learn a little bit about what we're drinking here. And Tell all your friends just because they don't have the box doesn't mean they can't uh, tag along with their, uh, you know, a, a few fingers of their own favorite whiskey and just chat with us about whiskey or next month mixology. Holiday yeah. mixology. Yeah. While we're waiting for people to get here, next month is a holiday mixology um, class and we are very excited about it. We actually just got our kit together. Maybe we'll give you a little preview later tonight, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but we're going to be making three different super festive cocktails and enough for two people to share. So there's going to be two cocktails of each. So that'll be a fun way to kick off the holiday season and learn how to make some fun festive cocktails that you can make throughout the rest of the season. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're excited about these for sure. All right, let's get started. I like to reward people for being on time and not punish those who are, are <laughs> here for waiting for people who are joining a little bit later. So let's get started, shall we? Indeed. All right. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to walk us through, um, Evan's going to walk us through some. We're going to walk me, us through. Yes, but he's our, our <laughs> professionally trained here. I've just learned a lot being, being part of his life. Um, so we're going to walk you through some tasting techniques. We're basically going to teach you how to taste whiskey like a pro, dare I say. Um, and you know, the reason we do this is not to necessarily teach you to be a pro, to get you to like change careers and go and be a whiskey steward or anything like that. But really we do it so that you have better odds of finding and discovering whiskeys that you love in the future. The better you can taste through things, understand your own palate, explain to someone else what you like about it, what you don't like about it, the better you're going to be able to navigate this wide, wide world of craft whiskey. There are so many craft whiskeys out there today and find ones that you love. So instead of being someone who simply, you know, says, 
I'm a bourbon drinker and sticking to bourbon. Instead, you can say, you know, I really like whiskeys that have notes of kind of cereal and less of the vanilla and like the, the cinnamon and more of the cereal. And that's going to help people who know a lot about whiskey lead you to all sorts of different things. Maybe bourbon, maybe not bourbon, right? So it helps you kind of get out of those, those not stereotypes. That's not the word I'm looking yeah, for. Yeah, just kind of repetitive kind of natures that we all fall into those, those traps of you know, this is the whiskey I like, this is the whiskey I drink, and I'm, I'm set, I'm good with that. Yeah. And, you know, the exploration is something that we really espouse to be one of the main reasons that um, we wanted to start Sip Scout, so that you can explore with us, because uh, we love doing it, and we find that a lot of people might just need a little bit of a nudge yeah. once in a while. Um, and, you know, especially with uh, with something like whiskey, you know, going and tasting through several iterations of kind of the same thing really helps to, to delve deep. Um, and, it helps to illuminate a, a, a quote by William Faulkner, which is that there's no such thing as a bad whiskey. Uh, just some whiskeys are better than others. Exactly. And, uh... <laughs> exactly. and we always like to tell people too, you know, if there's anyone on the call today who's like, you know, I really love bourbon, but I don't like rye. We also like to say, you just haven't found the rye that you like yet. So persist, persevere, keep trying them, keep <laughs> drinking. I promise you there was one out there for your palate. Um, because again, the range is wide. So with that, Let's get started. We'll do a little cheers. I'm going to grab this first one here. You can... I guess I'll grab the last one. All right. We're going to do a little cheers. Cheers. Hey. Thank you for having your cameras on and joining us there. We love that. Cheers to uh, all of you. Thanks for joining. Yeah. And so we're doing this too, to go ahead and dive right in and just take a sip. We're going to talk a little bit about all the proper steps, but we don't want to hold you back from drinking your whiskey. Sometimes we forget to say that. Very much so. So yeah, as we go through these tasting techniques, don't feel like you can't take a sip because we haven't gotten to the sip step yes. yet. Um, Evan has a lot of knowledge that he's going to share. So it might take us a little while to get to the actual sip step. But while we're waiting to get there, you can absolutely be practicing what he's teaching you and going up and down the line. You can take sips of all of these. You've all drank whiskey before. You don't need us to tell you exactly what to do. Try dosing it with a little bit of some uh, distilled water or just tap water. If you've got it, if you've got any kind of bottled water, we would recommend using that if you're going to be yeah, still and... filtered. Absolutely. Yeah. Always try them straight first. Even if you're someone who's a diehard, I like a rock in it. I like water in it. We'll talk a little bit about that, but always try it straight first. That is the way the distiller intended. And you don't know where you want to go until you know where you're starting. Right. Definitely. Um, and also one other note before we dive in, don't stick your nose real deep into this whiskey glass. Like you might, uh Oh, just knocked over a glass of water. Move that sip scout box. Maybe. Um, you don't want to stick your nose real deep into the glass like you do maybe with wine tasting, if you're a little more familiar with wine tasting, because this is high proof. It's going to really burn out your nose if you do that, especially as we go through all six. So Evan's going to talk you through the nosing step as we get there, but just a little preview so we don't miss you. Like keep it a little lower and take it, take it slow. All right, so um, and then just wiping up a little water that we had a little spill on, but no big deal. Luckily, no wires were in the way. Um, <laughs> no sparks. No sparks, no sparks, no outages. So we're going to start with this Clona Kilty Pork Cask Irish Whiskey. And, you know, it's a little interesting to start off with a finished whiskey. So the Pork Cask is a finishing step. So after they make the whiskey, after they age the whiskey, they put it into a used port barrel essentially to give it a kiss of that port flavor and so people who know whiskey might be like really you're starting with a port cask finish whiskey the reason we're doing this is because irish whiskeys actually tend to be a little lighter a little easier drinking a little uh, often lower abv this one is lower lower proof as well um, and so that's kind of why we're starting here um, and this is an irish distillery um, and so irish distilleries often distill some of their own, but also source different whiskeys from different distilleries as well and kind of blend them together. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting one for us to start with here. Clona Kilty, I like saying their name. For some yeah, reason. Clona Kilty is great. Um, I believe they're on the southern coast of, of, uh, of Ireland. Uh, and something that is an interesting kind of element to note when it comes to coastal distilleries, and this is a, not an uncommon thing at all in Scottish distillers, especially the ones in Islay, and the, the outer uh, the outer coastal regions of Scotland um, is that they can sometimes uh, incorporate a little bit of a distinctive briny characteristic, frankly, from this the you know the sea yeah. kind of mist, 
filling into the distillery, which are, you know, distilleries by and large, the rick houses where the barrels are kept are open air. And so the sea air can get in there and um, it essentially is going to breathe this salty sea air in and out of the barrels for the course of the three, four, seven, 12 years that they're aging. Um, this one has a, just a wisp of it. I do feel like the sweetness of the port cast that it's finished in kind of covers it, covers it. Mm -hmm. um, but there is this kind of, it, it's more, it's more ethereal. And then it's definitely something more, I think that you catch on the nose. It's not really like you're tasting salt water yeah. um, or like, you know, broth or something like that. Yeah. So our tasting techniques to get started there are first, there's a little gnat flying around here. Yeah, so, you know, initially when you begin to evaluate a, a, a dram of, of spirit of whiskey, um, you start with the visual inspection of it. Um, and especially if you have these all poured out in front of you, you'll notice that not only is this one lighter in mm -hmm. color, but as we go through these steps, as Suzanne was saying, it's also lighter in flavor and, and in mouthfeel and, and, and texture. Um, the visual inspection can give you a little bit of a clue as to how long it was aged in wood. The longer it spends in wood, the more color it's going to pull from the wood. Um, think of it like brewing a, a, a you know a cup of tea. Uh, you put the tea bag in there for a minute, you get a little color. You leave it in there for five minutes, you get a lot more color. Um, that same process is going on as the whiskey sits in the barrel. And then additionally, um, you'll notice in some of these, actually, you know, I feel like. None of these are particularly cloudy, I mean, cloudy mm -hmm. but sometimes you can find like a cloudy um, opacity to whiskeys, um, which is an indication that they have not been chill filtered. Now, it's hard to say if these have or have not been because generally the cloudiness that you see is only visible at a certain temperature. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we often like to say, you know, a lot of times the cloudiness, the unfiltered scares people away. So if they're, you know, looking at something in the store, deciding what to buy, and they see something that doesn't look pristine and clear, that often makes them think maybe it's not as high of quality and walk away. But actually, now that you're in the Sip Scout know here, that actually, I would say lean in. When you see something that's a little cloudy, that usually gives you an indicator that they're filtering it less. Um, and when you do, when you don't do chill filtration at all, or when you filter it fewer times, what you're doing is you're leaving a lot more of those like heavy esters in there, those oils, those things that give flavor. Um, and so it's actually, but it's very hard to do um, and it's hard to do well. And that's why it's something that craft makers do. And also, you know, as Americans, we've been taught to think that pristine crystal clear is beautiful. And, you know, that's one of our, the American ways. And so now, you know, though lean into those yeah. cloudier. And if you see something that says unfiltered, like that's interesting. Um, that means they're really standing behind the flavor that comes through there. And, you know, and also on the flip side, when you see some of those vodkas out there that say eight times filtered, 12 times filtered, it's not a good thing, right? They, they trick you because the bigger the number, the better is like a common thing that we all think. But actually that just means they're stripping out tons of flavor. They're stripping out all of that flavor and that's not what you want. Um, one last thing with the visual inspection, you can also look at the viscosity. Um, and you often hear this talked about a lot more with wine, but uh, as you kind of roll your, your tumbler around your glass around, you'll see the way that the whiskey kind of beads up and cascades on the outside of the glass. The legs. The legs, yes. The, the legs is um, probably the most common term for this. The tears, um, church windows is mm -hmm. kind of a fun one. That can give you an indication of the overall alcohol percentage and uh, as a result, you know, the viscosity. So, or I guess probably switch that around. Um, and the longer that a whiskey is aged, you know, the more that these uh, tiers will kind of spread and space out in the glass. So instead of getting like multiple ones right next to each other, you'll get like five or six around the entire circular surface area. Um, okay. We have a poll up there. Looks like we have a couple oh. answers. So um, funnily enough, you're all right, because this is hotly debated. <laughs> Scotland and Ireland are constantly going toe to toe about like who made whiskey first. Right. Um, and so this is one of those hotly debated things that, you know. This is kind of before any measure of strongly recorded history. Um, and the Gales, the Gales, someone up there got it right. Yeah. Yeah, um, someone up there got it right for sure. 
Um, and if you're not familiar, you know, I, something I often, I think of Ireland with whiskey quite a bit, um, but Ireland is actually really well known for their gins as well. And I didn't, I didn't actually realize that until a couple of years ago. Um, and Irish gin can be quite lovely. So if you're a gin drinker, check out some Irish gin as well. One of the things that I feel, at least, you know, in my heart of hearts, leads me to think of Scotland as being the OG. place. <laughs> And this is kind of silly because I'm sure it's the same in, in, in Ireland, um, but just the way it was told to me, in Scotland, they don't call it scotch. They, they, just, they just call it whiskey. Right. That's the only kind of whiskey they drink in Scotland. Right. Anything else would be like, oh, American whiskey. Like, right. This is whiskey. It's all relative, right? right. Like where you are, what you call the thing, right? Absolutely. Um, so the next step there, uh, and again, like I said, we're just doing this with the first one. What do we Tear do? through these, go back and forth, you know, bounce back. I think one of the best ways to kind of train your, your nose and your palate when you're tasting is a comparative thing. So if you're just going through in the order that we're tasting them and not Run reflecting back, back, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice here. And also if you're just finishing one whiskey before you move on to the second one, right? That's also, you know, you don't want to do that because you yeah. want to kind of play around with it a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as we move on to our second step, maybe I can tell you a little bit about this um, American Single Malt in case you do want to move over to it. So this one is from um, Vapor Distillery, actually, is the distillery, but it's called Boulder Spirits. So the, the brand of Single Malt is called Boulder Spirits. They're in Colorado in Boulder. Um, and actually, so this American Single Malt, the founder, he's actually from Scotland. Um, and funny little tidbit about him, he actually was on Survivor and was kicked off oh, of Survivor. Right. He was on Survivor Panama Didn't way back it. then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he's, you know, he's a he's a Scotman and he's low in the wild wilderness and into all that stuff. And I think he was also part of the Royal Navy as well. Um, and so he came over to Colorado, fell in love with Colorado, and really wanted to bring his heritage of making amazing scotch and bring it over to America and give it a little twist. And we can talk a little bit about what that twist is, but why don't you get on to your second step sure. there? Um, it's funny. I, I think of a Scotsman that was in the Navy and like, I just can picture him in Colorado, like throwing axes at trees. I mean, you feel like he should have won Survivor, right? <laughs> exactly. I feel, I feel, I feel like, like all of Scotland must have just been like, <laughs> <"Boo."> <laughs> All right. So our second step. So the first one is sight. They're all, they're all S's. It helps that you remember all of them. So the, see, the, the five S's. Um, so see it visually, you know, your sight step and then smelling it um, or sniffing it. And I generally like to remember it with the word sniff simply because it helps me remember to think about smelling the way that a dog smells. Think about how a dog kind of like, you know, they put their nose in the ground, like... And they kind of move around and do the little like sniffs. The reason they're doing that is because they're sniffing in and sniffing out very quickly. Um, and when they they blow out of their nose, they're adding humidity. And when you add humidity to something, you can see sometimes when Evan does this, it kind of fogs up his glass. Um, oh, but yeah. when you're when you breathe out, you add humidity. And when things are humid, you can smell them more strongly. Um, so, you know, we live in Arizona where it's very dry versus someone who lives in Florida, the smells are very much more pungent in that humid air. And so adding some humidity as you're smelling and sniffing like a dog yeah. in, out, in, out, in, out, um, helps you, helps you find those aromas that might be hard to find. Kind of a, a fun brief aside, little tidbit, um, every year that they proctor the exam to become a master sommelier, uh, it's hosted of all places in Houston, Texas. If you need some humidity to assist you in your smelling and evaluating of the glass of wine in front of you, no better place than Houston, Texas. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, the nosing step is probably the one that I get kind of tapped under the table most frequently by Suzanne, because this is the one that I'll spend- It's 45 most time minutes from now, we'll still be talking, talking about smelling about. our whiskey. <laughs> um, but it is a pretty fascinating step. It's the one that is the most revelatory in the tasting experience. Um, it can tell you the most of all the steps about what might be going on in that whiskey. Um, it, it helps to illuminate the source material that's used to make it, what type of grain is in your whiskey, uh, you know, the aging technique, um, how long it was aged, 
not only, but also the barrel types that were used to age it. Um, the proof is something that you'll begin to kind of recognize, especially if it's really hot, you'll get to actually feel that. Mm -hmm. um, and moreover, your sense of smell is unlike the other senses in your body. It's a chemical sense as opposed to a physical sensation. Um, and as such, it accesses your brain in a different way. And it actually bypasses most of the frontal lobes and goes directly into your memory. And so your ability to access memories via smells and access smells via memories um, kind of goes in both directions. Uh, it's pretty remarkable the way that that works. Yeah, when um, I, we've I'm all sure walked into experience. a restaurant or somewhere yeah. and you're like, oh, that smell, it reminds me of excellent. And it's just like, it transports you. Yeah, you're back in your, your grandmother's kitchen yeah. and she's whipping up a whatever. Now, the thing about smell is it's one of our um, senses that we don't use actively very often. We don't often go around blind smelling something and saying, what does that smell like, right? We don't do that very often, um, but it can be trained. So you can get better at this. And I am living proof of this. When I first met Evan, I was like, smells like whiskey. <laughs> and now I can really with wine, with everything, but it's because I have the conversation and I take a little bit of time. I'm not just drinking and kind of ignoring it. I spend some time with my nose in there and I'm kind of pushing my brain and I'm paying attention to more what things smell like outside of when I'm doing this. Right. Um, so if it's something that, and you know, we've all been sick and you have a stuffed nose and you eat something and it tastes like cardboard, your nose is such a critical part of your palate. So if you're not spending a little bit of time with your nose in your whiskey, your nose in your wine, while you're drinking it, before you're drinking it, you're actually kind of robbing yourself of the full experience flavor wise as well. So we really, that's one of the reasons Evan likes to spend a lot of time here because if we can teach you one thing tonight and you walk away with one thing, have a little like smelling conversation, have a with, conversation. Your, with your, with your, with your drink. Yeah. And frankly, that conversation, I feel like from maybe a, a, someone who's just kind of getting into this idea, the best conversation to have is a focus on three kind of elemental components of what you might be perceiving um, with regard to aromas. And they are the primary aromas, which are the types of grains that are used in this particular whiskey that is in front of you, as well as how heavily malted or toasted or cooked they are. Sometimes it's not at all, sometimes it's very strongly. Secondary aromas, which are aromas that come from the fermentation process, the type of yeast that's used, sometimes that can influence and create some interesting aromas, as well as the distillation process where you're making the cuts and separating the stuff that's literally gonna make you blind if you drink it from the really heavy pinus resiny tar type aromas and flavors at the end of the distillation. There's a, a process during distillation where at the beginning of dist distillation stuff starts to come off the still and eventually you make a cut and you remove what are known as the heads. And then from this, that middle part, from that first cut to the second cut, you capture what's known as the heart. And that's really the best of the best. Um, and then the, the remaining part is the tails. That's where all the kind of heavy, kind of stinky, off odor, tar type smells come from. Yeah. And then last but not least, the tertiary aromas. These are aromas that come from the aging process. So once it's done distillation and goes into barrel, um, the flavors and the aromas that come from its time that's spent in the barrel are what you're going to get in the tertiary aromas. So just trying to pick out one, some, one thing distinct that you can kind of put your finger on, even if it's not with a lot of confidence, in each one of those three kind of categories is a, a very simple starting place to begin that conversation and, and like have a measure of comfortability in talking about whiskeys and what you like and what you don't like. Um, I'm gonna share just briefly here, um, something else that's very helpful. Um, and this is a whiskey aroma wheel. Um, and you can find these all over Google. You just whiskey aroma wheel. Um, yeah, this is very helpful. So having something like this in front of you um, and initially just trying to stay within the center part of the circle and just recognizing something that is, is that a fruity smell or is that a floral smell? Those are kind of close. That's why they're close together. Floral is also kind of close to grassy. That's why they're close to each other on the, on the circle. So kind of go around that circle and find the initial 
category and then push yourself to make a step into the next outer ring and then potentially even into the third ring. Um, so, you know, starting with something like fruity, but then pushing yourself to say, well, that's more citrus than perhaps, you know, like a, a tree fruit, like a pear or an apple. Um, and in fact, it's, I think it's more like a grapefruit than it is like an orange. And then heck, see if you can decide whether it's grapefruit zest or grapefruit juice or grapefruit candy, or if it's ruby red grapefruit. This is really how you get good. It infuriates me, don't get me wrong. <laughs> so I, I always feel like I'm like, I'm so proud of myself for picking out like, oh, I get cherries in this. And then Evan is like, is it stewed cherries or is it baked cherries? Is it ripe cherry? Is it is it the like golden cherries or the red cherries? Is it a Luden's cough drop? Or is it cough syrup? And I'm like, is the cherries enough? I'm proud of myself for getting cherries. It sure is. But it, it is, sure is. But it is like the more you can do that, the more you can find things in your whiskey and enjoy it and like just understand why you like this whiskey so much versus why you don't like this whiskey. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's really fun um, as well. So. I mean, it helps you slow down and enjoy your your booze a little bit more slowly. Um, we'll put the the link in the uh, chat here so that you can download that PDF that includes this whiskey aroma wheel here as well. Because yeah, like I said, um, it's something that I find to be quite helpful, even though I've been doing this for a decade plus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Does anyone want to share what they're smelling in? Yeah. Either, either of the first couple of whiskeys, any, any, give us some thoughts. If you, if you, any so, smells coming to life, you can throw them in so the chat and then mute yourself. <clears throat> and then, and then we'll play a little game called dance monkey dance, no. where we make the certified sommelier tell us what he's smelling. In <laughs> uh, let's see if I can't pull this up here for you. <clears throat> yeah. So this whiskey spelling while we're seeing if anyone will be brave, but it's not brave because there's no wrong answer. Like whatever you smell, especially with smells, it's, it's tied to your memory. If you've never smelled something before, you're not going to be able to find it in whiskey, right? So it's personal. Oh, go ahead. What you got there for us, Bob and Gus? We um, thought that the port cast had a mapley aftertaste, a little secondary mapley, almost maybe even bordering on honey. I, there was a nice sweet flash, you know, after swallowing mm -hmm. the backwash. <laughs> you know, it's funny when I stuck my nose in it, I was, when Evan was talking about the smelling steps, I was really pushing myself to try to find something. And I thought maple too. And I thought that was, so that's interesting that we both came up with that. That must mean we're right. It's <laughs> support overtone. It's support overtone. Yeah. Right yeah. Like but that, you know, like I would also, I would also, uh, say that to an extent, not only is Irish whiskey relatively light and like more floral and less kind of earthy woodsy, it does tend to be a little bit sweeter to my palate in general as well, maybe even without the port cask influence. Um, I feel like when I just think of, you know, a standard Jameson or, or Bushmills or something like that, those tend to show on the sweeter side for me. Um, I think that the port for me comes in with like a little bit of like a almost like a pruniness. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, don't they have a wide array of, is it all light? I mean, is that, you know, don't they have some heavy, you know, Guinness kind of whiskeys? Yeah, they do. Uh, and I would just, and, and, and I would just say like, generally gen a character as a standard, unless you're getting into, you know, a Jameson that's 21 years old or yeah. a Napanog Castle that's 15 years old, they tend to show lighter a and fresher fresher a yeah, fresh, yeah, fresh, yeah, way. Okay. yeah yeah it's kind of, kind of similar to how people often say like bourbon tends to be sweeter rye tends to be spicier like that's not true of all bourbons and rye, of course but generally yeah and stereotypes exist for a reason yeah, in some for ways sure. <laughs> yeah for better for worse mm -hmm. um where is this uh, i'm still looking for the the I'll whiskey find i'll find out okay don't worry about it um and then the whiskey spelling, yeah. This this one's a fun one. This is one that I. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, it is actually one person got it right there. The spelling of the country, if it has a name in the e, then whiskey has an e. If this name of the country does not have an e in it, Japan, for example, they do not spell whiskey with an e. Now there's no rule about this. It's not regulated. It's not legislated. It just kind of happens to be the way the cards have fallen over the years. There are some who buck the trend. There's even one in our lineup today. If you can 
find it um, that spells it without an E, even though United States of America has an E in it. Um, and so, you know, people, people go away from it a little bit, but that's a general rule of thumb. So you know how to spell whiskey depending on where. Yeah, I'm not sure the reasoning behind the one in our kit that defies the naming convention, but um, for example, uh, Maker's, Maker's Mark, Mark. Yeah, Maker's Mark, Mark does not use an E in the naming of their whiskey. And for their reasoning, um, the heritage of the founder is right. Scottish. It's Scottish, so, so he goes back to the original exactly. spelling of whiskey. And it also um, changes how you spell the plural of whiskey as well, which I definitely didn't know for a long time. And yeah. one of my clients kept yelling at me because I kept spelling it I-E-S instead of E-Y-S. So if it's with an E, it's E-Y-S. If it's without an E, it's I-E-S. Extra confusing. Yeah. Lots of fun. <laughs> Grammar, spelling. Whee! This is all in Evan's wheelhouse. <laughs> Um, so let's move on here to, well, I guess, yeah, I'm let's still, the single I'm still talking about the forecast for the tasting steps, but we've talked about the single malt, um, as a category, single malts in the United States are kind of a new burgeoning category. For sure. Um, they actually just got an official designation. That's right. Um, as American single malt now has kind of regulations and rules about what an American single malt can be. Yeah, the same way that there are governmentally imposed restrictions on the necessary requirements to label your whiskey as bourbon whiskey, there are now similar requirements uh, to label it as, an, um, as a single malt whiskey. Um, very similar to the restrictions that I, are in existence in Scotland for a single malt whiskey. Um, one of the main differences though is the aging regimen in the United States, they don't have the same aging requirements and restrictions that they do in Scotland to be labeled as a single malt whiskey. Um, and I think it makes for a little bit more of an expansive category mm -hmm. um, and a little bit more of an opportunity for the distillers to explore. Yeah, really. absolutely. Um, how many people, when they think of scotch or single malt, many when you say single malt, people think of scotch. Um, I guess I can't see people's hands, but I'd be curious if you, your brain goes to peated or smoky when you hear that. Well, that's a good point, yeah. Because I feel like um, a lot of people, oh, is there a reason the E rule does not extend to the Texas? Yeah. You well, found, we it. found it. You found it. You found our exception in the lineup. Yeah, they, um, I, I, we looked into this. Did they have a rationale or was it just like, we buck the trend, we're Texan, like we do our own thing? To my recollection, there is no Scottish heritage in the, three founders um, lineup, backup. Yeah. But you think that there could have? I, I think there might have been. I think. And maybe just because that's the reason that Maker's Mark uses yeah, to we omit that. the E. We, um, we'll talk a little bit more about Balcones, but we we really love them. And they they are as Texas, Texas. as Texas as yet. Um, and they really do like to celebrate, you know, Texan and like all that. And so our, our theory a little bit is that they just like to buck the trend, honestly. Yeah. And they just like to be like, we're doing it our way. And and honestly, you know, a lot of the original, well, I guess not. I guess that's not true because Ireland spells it with an E. I was going to sure. say some of the OGs of whiskey. Right. That was one of my, um, yeah. So it's a little bit of a, a mystery, but. They do buck the trend for sure. Um, you want to talk about how this is Scottish in origin, this single malt, but American in style? Yeah. So, I mean, Scottish in origin in the extent that, like, you don't really see a lot of single malt whiskeys being produced in the United States. Most of the whiskeys that you see being produced here, by and large, uh, use a mash bill, which is, you know, the... The recipe, essentially. Yeah, the composition, the percentage, comparative percentages of the grains that are used to make it. Um, to be whiskey, it has to be 100% grain-based. Mm -hmm. um, and for a single malt, it's all malted barley. And barley is just not a very commonly grown grain here in the United States. So most um, of our whiskey is using other grains, not right. barley, um, which is why single malts have not been. Uh, additionally, here. a single malt has to be uh, all distilled in one distillery in one distillation uh, by one distiller. Uh, it's kind of similar to the requirements for something that is labeled as bottled and bond in the United States um, without the proof restrictions and I think the distiller restrictions. Um, anyway, uh, there's some 
interesting components about the American single malts is that are coming on the scene right now because very few of them are peated the way that most Scotch whiskeys are. Although a few are, especially using um, the Pacific Northwest, they have some peat bogs and some like oh, yeah, up there. Right. Up in Seattle. Um, and that yeah, area. Westland Distillery is one that's doing an American peated whiskey um, that is very fun. They are sadly no longer craft. They just, they sold recently to a bigger company, but um, but yeah, there are some interesting peated ones. Boulder, Boulder Spirits as well. Does Boulder they, Spirits does yep. a peated one as well. Yeah, you're right. So the influence of peat moss in the production of Scotch whiskey is it's used as a fuel source to toast the barley in the malting process. The kilning. Yeah. yeah the kilning of the barley so that it kind of caramelizes the grain and actually releases the sugars so that it can ferment and become alcoholic um, is done using the only fuel source that they had in Scotland. They don't have big forests there. Yeah. Uh, you know, the highlands are just rocks and moss. And, and so they would harvest these, uh, these peat bogs and let the moss in the peat bogs dry out. And then that was their fuel source. Um, and the smoke from that very distinct especially because the peat moss is damp when they start working with it and so it kind of almost like smokes extra it does smoky. it's extra smoky yeah um and so that's where you can get very smoky scotches and single malts and but you cannot can get ones that don't even really have barely any of that kiss of smoke right um and i think this is a great example of really what you get as the grain characteristic of barley mm -hmm. without any influence of other grains and without the influence of the quote-unquote taint <laughs> Of, of peat moss, of the, of the smoking process that you see in Scotland. And for me, what comes through a lot here is kind of a, like a ripe banana characteristic mm. and also um, really like dark multi-grain bread mm -hmm. with, you know, the, those breads that you find that have like sprouted uh, seeds and lots of, you know, nuts and whole grains. Um, and I feel like that characteristic, that like malted barley characteristic is it's generally very cereally, and I feel like that's where the bread part comes from. Um, the banana part, I would venture to say, is probably more about the fermentation and maybe the yeast that they used in the fermentation of the barley. Um, and then the cool thing about this single malt compared to, again, uh, Scottish examples and American examples in general is that lack of restriction with regard to aging. So in Scotland, Single malts have to be aged in barrels that are classified as, as neutral or, or used. They've been previously uh, used to, you know, age sherry is a very common one. Another common uh, one, bourbon. though, is bourbon. bourbon yeah, so well. a lot of used bourbon barrels from America get shipped over to Scotland, and that's what they're aging their, their scotch in. Right. But they can't use new oak barrels. Right. And the, the, the thing with new oak barrels versus... I, I call them used, but neutral oak barrels, um, is new oak gives a very strong flavor, like much strong. It's almost like using a brand new tea bag versus using a tea bag a second time around, right? Yeah. So if you think of that, like makes a very strong cup of tea versus like a diluted cup of tea. So if you want that like oaky kind of caramely, all those flavors that Evan was talking about before that comes from the barrel aging process, then that new barrel is what you want to go with, sure. right? But so Scotland has restrictions that you cannot use new barrels in Scotland. So they have a much lighter touch of that barrel aging flavor for scotch. Whereas in American whiskey, we don't have that uh, restriction. And so this whiskey in particular is using new charred oak barrels. Right. So it has more of that barrel aging kick on top of the malted barley kind of scotchiness. Scotchiness. Yeah, that's really quite nice. And I feel like the ability or the, the freedom to use new oak, uh, you know, for single malts here in the U.S. probably allows distillers to, you know, get to market a little bit quicker. Yeah. Because when you're aging something in neutral oak, in order to get enough of the oak flavoring in it, I mean, that's why most scotches you see uh, are 12-year-old minimum, you know, Glenfiddich. Then live it. it takes a while to get that flavor that they want out of it and even then they're usually closer in color to the irish whiskey that we've got here than they are to the you know, the boulder spirits yeah. single malt <clears throat> you know when we kicked off today we didn't even mention that essentially today this is this is a great primer and exploration of whiskey um because we have six different whiskey styles 
So as we're going through, this first one was an Irish whiskey. The second one is an American single malt whiskey. We're going to keep going through this with a corn whiskey, a bourbon, a um, what are we, a hopped whiskey, a, a blended yeah. whiskey, and then finally a rye. So it's six different styles from six different craft makers, also from six different regions. Mm. Um, and Very so true. it's really a nice landscape. So if anyone is you know new to whiskey in your life, this is a really nice primer for them to understand all the different styles and like the whiskey umbrella and the different sub segments beneath it. Which uh, direction you'd like to explore further. Yeah. And <laughs> actually on that note, I did want to mention on your SIP Scout report here, you have a, a link at the bottom if you wanted to buy full bottles or if you wanted to um, do that. We actually just today got this whiskey kit up on there. So you can buy this whiskey kit as one-offs all into the future. So, um, because we felt like this was one yeah. that was very educational and if we wanted to share the world. In your life that might enjoy a whiskey box for Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. Who so you can, you can get this one whiskey kit <laughs> in perpetuity. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, our third tasting technique. Yeah, let's get to the fun part, right? <laughs> so you've got sight and then you've got sniff and then you've got sip. Um, something that we kind of glossed over uh, is marginally helpful with, yeah, with whiskey. Um, you want to be gentle, uh, but swirling the whiskey around in your glass um, can be helpful to release some of the more volatile aromas. But in general, spirits are pretty volatile already, mm -hmm. so you, they don't need a lot of help to release some of these aromas and flavors the way that you might expect with a, a, a wine tasting. Um, but, you know, simply tilting the glass on its side and just rolling it and rotating it in your hand and coating the inside of the glass uh, will release some of those more volatile aromas um, that, frankly, you can get without even sticking your nose too close to it. You can just kind of like let them waft up. And those tend to be the lighter, brighter, brighter aromas, the more floral notes. Um, but yeah, the, the next step when you go ahead and dive in to take a sip. Um, <clears throat> You want to make sure that you get enough of the whiskey in your mouth that you actually get to taste it. Just like wetting your lips or kind of tip, tipping your tongue in there is generally not sufficient, but you don't want to take too big of a swig um, so that you don't have an opportunity to taste it because of the alcohol. Um, so something that is really helpful both before and during the tasting step is kind of chew and build up some saliva in your mouth. That saliva is going to help protect the inside of your mouth from the high alcohol that you get when you take a sip. There's a reason that when you say buffalo wings, a lot of people will salivate. The spice, the heat, the, you know, the actual temperature heat, as well as the chili heat, both of those things can damage the sensitive tissue in the inside of your mouth. And so your body learns to salivate in anticipation of taking a bite of buffalo wings taking a bite of lemon, any number of things like that. And so if you don't have saliva in your mouth, when you take a sip, it's gonna burn a lot more. So just kind of chewing like that will kind of activate your salivary glands. And then when you take a sip, you can kind of chew it and wash it around in your mouth and let it mix with the saliva. Saliva is actually a really important conduit for the taste experience. It helps to transmit flavors to the, you know, the, the taste buds that you have, not just on your tongue, but all over the inside of your mouth. They are on your cheeks, on your gums, underneath your tongue, on the roof of your mouth. So just taking a bite and, or I'm sorry, just taking a sip and letting it wash down the back of your throat kind of denies you of the full sensory experience of the taste of the whiskey. Hopefully you guys, I have been sipping all along, like we said. Takes us a little while to get to this step, but you on the baby blue now? Mm hmm So I tend to leave it in my mouth for about five to seven seconds. Um, and you can see he was almost like chewing it as yeah. it was in his mouth. Now you don't want to do the Listerine swish because that aerates it and that will make it burn more actually if you yeah. introduce oxygen. I'll just take my tongue and push it up into the roof of my mouth, kind of let it cascade down my cheeks, pull up underneath my tongue, and then just kind of gently let it wash from either side before swallowing. And, 
And the good thing about doing that on your first sip is if you do that, if you take a sip, chew it, move it around, kind of spend a minute with it and then swallow it, you're not going to really enjoy it that much, to be honest. Like you're, you're not. And that's a good thing because your first sip of anything is really supposed to be all about acclimating your mouth, especially when we're talking about high proof. So high proof spirits, the first time you taste something new, even if it's the next whiskey, it's something new, but it's high proof. Your mouth is just kind of going like, whoa, that's a lot. That's all that's happening. And so if you're judging a whiskey on the first sip, you're kind of doing it a disservice. So by doing what Evan's talking about, they call it the Kentucky chew, actually. Um, right. by, do, by doing that, you're, you're basically priming your palate like a primer when you're painting, right? You're kind of like getting it ready. And then your second sip is when you want to start to like evaluate now that your mouth is kind of used to what's coming. Um, that's when you want to start to evaluate. So it's a good, good trick to do to like remind yourself not to judge something on the first taste. Like, like mom always said, you got to try it two times before you don't eat it. At least my mom always said that. Couldn't say I liked something after just one bite. Oh, you couldn't say you didn't like it. That, that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could say I liked it after Sure, one I'm bite. sure that was totally Give fine, me more right? cake, please. <laughs> more carrots. Yes, I love carrots. <laughs> Does anyone smell anything in this? This whiskey, I'm, I'm always curious, um, and I'm, I'm picking on this whiskey in particular for a little bit of a reason, I guess. I guess because I, off, I, I, I just hit me in the face with it. Anyone, anyone want to share anything? Or I can just tell you what I'm smelling in it. I see some movement. Mm -hmm. I gave you guys a clue. Yeah. The, the odors are a little, little like white grapes. Oh, like grapes. Did you guys comment on your, you know, your estimation of flavor? flavor and overtones and stuff. Sorry, you're you're kind of cutting out there. I got peed out of that one. You got peed got out of the baby blue? Okay. Mm -hmm. No longer grapes. I'm, I'm talking about taste. Could you comment on your um, estimation of the different overtones? I, I'm be curious to compare them to mine because I got a, a peaty, I got a little peaty hit off that. Sweet peat, but not like some yeah. of the other peaty, peaty yeah. stuff I drink. Yeah, the this like one, Glenn Morangi is like, like having a peat in your mouth. <laughs> um, I said it wrong, didn't I? No, not at all. Glenn Morangi is exactly right, and I think it is like a peat, like a sweet peat in your mouth. It, it definitely has a sweetness to it, and uh, I, that's why I was that's why I was working. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what Glenn Morangi is like. <laughs> um, I don't get. I don't feel like I get as much of the the peat to it but I also feel like I might have a pretty skewed understanding of peat frankly um and the delineating smokiness and peatiness and also I don't really like those kinds of whiskeys personally so I don't find myself drinking them a lot um but I do get sweetness in this and I do get I mean it's a corn whiskey but my god it smells like cornflakes and that's, so that's kind of a gimme, I guess, but um, yeah. Yeah. like cornflakes that have been sitting in. Yeah, the aroma is real sweet. Like sweetened condensed milk. Like if you ate your cornflakes with sweetened condensed milk, that's what this would smell like to me. So for me, <laughs> what, this often, what this often smells like for me <laughs> is, is an aged tequila. A, like a lightly aged tequila. And that's what I was alluding to there. You guys smell that? Almost like a reposado? Yeah, I, I, it always gets me. And we've had other people at some events that we've done in the past kind of comment on that as well. It's a little sweeter to me tonight than it usually is. I like before. that. Yeah, I don't mind yeah. it either. Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't care. Reposado is a good one. But now I'm back. I put a little water in mine. Now I'm back, smell wise, back to another little sweet maple leaf thing. I don't know. Oh, uh -huh. Just calm, maybe. I yeah, that, put a little water in it to get the maple leaf. Yeah, that sweetness, I think. I get uh, the bread part. 
the bread part in the in the uh, single malt. Oh, a bit of eggnog, yeah. Leslie says. Mm. I like that. Whoa, yeah. really? Cornflakes soaked huh. in eggnog. There you go. Yeah, That's forget sweet and condensed milk. Yeah. It's almost the holiday season. Like, let's have cornflakes and eggnog. Yeah. I'm okay with that. So are you frosted flakes or just regular cornflakes? Just regular, you know, straight cornflakes. Yeah. So Balcones is really it's like secret breakfast, huh? There you go. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. I think I'm going to have this instead of cereal in the morning every day. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually one of my favorite whiskeys. It makes beautiful old fashions. Um, I, don't, I don't know why it just, it just does. It makes really lovely old fashions. Um, and so the fun thing about this is it is a corn whiskey. It's actually a hundred percent corn, but it's a hundred percent blue corn. That's only grown in Texas. It's a native kind of species of corn in Texas. And so should I give some bourbon? <laughs> bourbon territory. Yeah, we're moving into bourbon territory. Any of you um, bourbon fans? Maybe. Fans of the bourbon? So this is 100% corn whiskey, um, but it's not called a bourbon. And honestly, mm. bourbon is so hot and has been so hot for so long in our country, they would probably sell a hell of a lot more of this if they called it bourbon. But they can't call it bourbon because they do not use new charred oak barrels. And in order to be called bourbon, that's one of the requirements, you have to use new charred oak barrels. And the reason they don't use new charred oak barrels is because they are so proud of this Texan blue corn that is native Texas. to the area, exactly, <laughs> that they want that flavor profile of the source ingredient to shine through. So when Evan was talking before about the primary and the secondary and the tertiary flavor or aromas and flavors, you know, they really want it to be that ingredient based, the source based flavors and aromas that come through because they're really proud of that. And they don't want the, the new charred oak to really kind of cover that up. Um, and so it's a really fun kind of contrast to bourbon. And, you know, bourbon is going to be our next whiskey that we move into to think about just what that corn base can deliver and what that can give to a whiskey. And this, I think it just, it showcases it beautifully. Yeah, and it's a nice kind of follow up to the American single malt, which is, you know, a single grain the same way yeah. the corn, the corn whiskey, the baby blue is a single grain, but it kind of highlights what the influence of new oak can do in the single malt and then neutral oak can allow for, yeah. maybe, uh, with the baby blue and really kind of letting that, as Suzanne was saying, the character of this unique and uh, I guess in some ways revered by Balcones strain of blue corn to take center stage. Yeah. Um, if you like this, they do make a American oak influence, I'm sorry, new oak influence yeah. version of this. Uh, it's called true blue. And they do actually label that as a bourbon as yeah. opposed to a corn whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find those on, on that, that site That's on right. your subscout report as well. Um, like we said, also the American single malt, there's a peated version of that. Balcones also does something called brimstone, which is a super smoky. Um, is it a bourbon? <laughs> I don't think it's a bourbon. I think it's just an American whiskey. But so what they do again, because they are like very proud to be Texas and they want to use as many local Texas ingredients as they can, instead of using something like peat to smoke their whiskey, they actually use tumbleweeds. Texas tumbleweeds that are kind of rolling around and they gather them all up and they set those on fire and that's what <laughs> so, they do. And it's so is, funny. And if you're a fan of smoky whiskey, I am. I love peated scotches. Like I really like that like smoke. Even for me, it is smoky. Like it's too much for him. Um, but it's it's awesome. It's fun in cocktails for sure, but it's it's a lot, but it's it's really, really fun. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um what's next? I guess we should tie in the savor the the, the corn last... whiskey to the bourbon whiskey yeah yeah uh so the bourbon whiskey uh the next one in the tasting there uh, our fort mose 1738 bourbon is um the one bourbon in our lineup mm -hmm. which as we were pulling this together we were like i kind of feel like we need to have more bourbons but no, we'll do it. We'll do a bourbon tasting. We'll do a down bourbon the road. tasting. Don't you worry. We got you. It'll be fine. Yeah. It'll be good. 
Um, but we did want to highlight bourbon because it's a pretty important whiskey in our country right now. And honestly, when we highlight bourbon in most of our kits, they're very rarely from Kentucky, funnily enough. It is odd that we don't have more of those. And I think it's partially because all the Kentucky bourbons have been gobbled up by big brands. Big brands. Yeah, there are, yeah. There are very few, you know, it's, it's probably pretty expensive to start a distillery in Kentucky these days. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there are very few like still independently owned small craft guys. I mean, there are some. Um, but it also, I think a lot of the Kentucky bourbons, most of you are likely familiar with, whereas we like to find bourbons from all over. Um, and so this one is actually made in Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is from West Palm Beach, um, made at uh, Palm Beach Distillery. And um, the name stems from a kind of an interesting part of uh, American, American history. history. Yeah, for sure. Um, there was a, a small town in Florida. It wasn't Florida, but, um, oh, that's right. This small town in Florida is where quite a few um, Blacks settled after an uprising in, I believe, North Carolina. Yeah, in the Carolinas, that's right. Yeah, they, there, was a, there was a slave uprising, uprising in North Carolina or South Carolina, and they kind of cast off their masters and they were refugees essentially they, yeah. they fled they fled to this town fort mose yeah migrated south and uh set up shop in in, uh, in florida yeah it was actually known i think it's the known as the first free black town in the united states right fort mose right and um, by like a a u.s like Congressional decree, I yeah, believe. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. Or at it least was, a Florida. It one. was in the the mid 1700s or early 1700s. Right. Um, and so the the founder of this this whiskey is is an African American um, as well. And so he really has strong aspirations to be the largest black owned distillery in the world. Is like he he dreams big, you know. And so he's he started out. And so this is really his first foray into whiskey. And he's partnered up with Palm Beach Distillery. Um, and Palm Beach Distillery is female founded, female owned. They have a whole different line of spirits called Lost Harbor Spirits. And so he's partnered up with them to kind of work together on this. And so this is, and they're getting a lot of really, they're winning a lot of awards. They're getting a lot of great press. Um, and it's, it's a lovely. Yeah, it's a perfectly delicious, uh, basically exactly what I think you would like from uh, a go-to whiskey. Uh, it really does. Bourbon. Um, yeah, 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 specifically, but it does, it does kind of check all the marks. I like it because it's not like cloyingly sweet. I find some bourbons, like they've really embraced that whole, um, and maybe we should take a step back and make sure everyone's clear on bourbon versus rye versus whiskey, you know, but sure. like, yeah. you know, so whiskey is the overarching category. There's scotch, there's Irish whiskey, there's place-based whiskeys, but then there's also grain-based whiskeys. Um, and so bourbon is defined as minimum of 51% corn. So it has to have at least 51% corn in its mash bill. The rest of it can be whatever grain they want. Um, it has to be aged in new charred oak barrels, as we said before. It cannot be put in the barrel at anything higher than 125 proof, believe. I believe. And it has to be distilled to no more than 160. Right. Um, and it has to be made in the United States. That's it. And so that's what makes bourbon bourbon. Um, and bourbon is known because corn, we just saw this with this 100% corn whiskey, the baby blue, that corn really lends a sweetness. You know, I mean, we have so much corn and so many of our things, high fructose corn syrup, all of this, right? <laughs> like, true. so corn really lends a sweetness. And so that's where bourbon lovers tend to like it because it's a little bit sweeter. Yeah. Whereas rye has very similar criteria, but that 51% has to be rye, the grain rye. And so if you think of rye bread and that spiciness, when you eat some rye bread, rye tends to be spicier, right? And so that's where that divide between bourbon lovers and rye lovers tends to be like sweet lovers, spicy lovers. We tend to like both of them. We really like high rye bourbon. So something that's called a high rye bourbon has that minimum 51% corn. And often it is close to that 51%. And then there's a large percentage of that remaining 49% that's rye. So you get some spice with the sweetness. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different variations there. Uh, one last note with regard to tasting techniques, since we mm -hmm. don't want to forget the last one. Um, the last step after you take your sip and after you've kind of swirled it around and swished it and done the Kentucky chew, um, is the step of savoring after you swallow or spit whatever final S word you want to use. Um, the way that 
the spirit lingers and persists in your mouth is a pretty good indicator of the overall balance. And balance is one of the best ways to uh, make a determination with regard to quality. A well-balanced spirit, a well-balanced beer, a well-balanced glass of wine um, will have characteristics that are in harmony. You know, it might be highly acidic, but it also might be sweet. And something that's acidic and sweet both kind of mellow each other out. That's why sweet and sour chicken is such a popular dish at Chinese restaurants. Um, and so looking to see how the, the whiskey after you've swallowed it continues to taste like it did when it was in your mouth after it no longer <laughs> is, is a, a really good indicator. And sometimes you'll taste whiskeys that you will continue to taste as they were when they were in your mouth for 30 seconds, mm -hmm. a minute, a minute and a half yeah. uh, is, is not an uncommon thing. And being mindful of that and being attentive and continuing to enjoy the experience of the tasting long after you finished the taste um, is kind of the final step in evaluating and appreciating whiskeys. Yeah. And we always really like to encourage people to, you know, especially as you get more into whiskey, wine, whatever, um, you know, to differentiate between quality and preference, right? So a lot of times when people are new to things, they'll just be like, oh, I don't like that. That's, that's awful. That's bad whiskey. That's horrible. And that's not necessarily true, right? Like the two things aren't, don't always go together. Something can be something you don't like and is disgusting to you and really displeasing to you, but it can be a high quality product and it can be made well. And that's where this final step of savoring helps you differentiate between that a little bit, right? We've all taken a sip of something where you take a sip and it like breaks your neck a little bit and you're like, oh, what, what just happened like a minute later? That's usually like something's out of balance. The quality is not quite perfectly there, right? And so differentiating between like a high quality product, like not for me, you can have that conversation with a distiller, right? You can say to a distiller, like, you know, this isn't for me, but I can tell it's beautifully made. Like, thank you for sharing that with me. But like my palate, I tend to, and that's where what you're learning tonight here will help you. I tend to like things that are more like this and like that and like this. Then you can just have that conversation without insulting them and just being like, oh, I don't like that. That's gross. Um, you know, <laughs> and so that's what we're always trying to encourage people. And to at do. the same time, you know, if you don't like red wine and someone pours you a glass of wine that's red and it could be a $200 bottle and, you know, you still may not like it. Maybe that will be the red wine that opens your eyes and opens your mind and your heart and your soul to red wine. But just because it's a very high quality example doesn't mean you're necessarily going to like it and vice versa. Absolutely. I mean, it's really kind of delightful finding something that you quite like and frankly, isn't that well made because gosh, it's probably cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's a nice differentiator there for sure. And we always encourage people to play around with that a little bit and, yeah. you know, really, really think about it. Um, I need to re-up my water. Do it. Um, another kind of corollary there is a lot of people think, you know, age means quality. So one, the one that everyone was just talking about, price and quality. So a lot of people are like, if this is a 200 bottle of whiskey, it must be good. That's not true, right? That's not necessarily true. There are plenty of cult things. I mean, we've all heard of Happy Van Winkle, right? high quality, very well made. Great. I've had plenty of whiskeys that I think are much more delicious than Pappy Van Winkle. I am never going to spend that amount of money for that. It's just not for me. I don't understand the like hubbub about it. Right. So it doesn't necessarily have to go hand in hand. And the other one, especially with whiskey that you hear a lot about is age. A lot of people think the older the whiskey, the better. Now we've talked a lot tonight about new oak, used oak, but also the time that it spends in oak. If it spends a really long time in oak, you're going to get a lot more of those like caramel. Um, my sick brain is not working. What are the other <laughs> coffee kind of, sure. you know, all coffee, those toffee vanilla, flavors, vanilla flavors, baking spices, baking, cinnamon, right. nutmeg. Right. Yeah. Versus the cereal, fruity, grassy things that, right. and so that's a preference. That is a pure preference. If you really like things that are caramely, sure the older, the better probably for you. If you really like things like this baby blue that is fresh and bright and tastes like corn, then you don't want a lot of age on that. That doesn't necessarily mean older is better. Yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty great comparison too. Those two in the middle, the, the baby blue and the Fort Mose, going back and forth. And if you have a preference, if you can kind of drill down and realize one way or another, if it's because of those uh, more prominent baking spices that you're getting in the actual bourbon that are... Uh, coming from the use of new oak, 
or if you're enjoying that kind of more like floral kind of grassy uh, cereal grainy characteristic from the baby blue, that's really helpful the next time you're picking out a bottle of whiskey at the local bottle shop. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, our last, next poll question, what style of whiskey was America founded on? Um, this is often a lot of people think bourbon uh, because bourbon is America's whiskey now. You know, America is known for bourbon. It has to be, yeah, you have to be made in America to be bourbon. Um, but actually it was rye. So rye was our original, like, yes, all right, they got it, good. <laughs> um, yeah, rye is what was predominantly grown, especially in New England, Maryland, Virginia, those regions. That is the grain that was grown primarily. There wasn't a lot of corn being grown at the time. I mean, even at this time, even today, yeah, the climate corn there, is in the Midwest. You need, yeah, you know, a little bit warmer weather for corn. And yeah. where we first settled in New England, that wasn't grown. Rye there. flourishes in that colder climate. You can grow it there. Yeah. And so the interesting thing is, you know, if you go to a cocktail bar nowadays and order a whiskey cocktail, 80% of those whiskey cocktails are made with bourbon, honestly. Sure. Um, and so people think that all of these cocktails are designed for bourbon, but all of the classic cocktails, all of the old school cocktails, old fashions, Manhattan, Sazeracs, like all of these things, they were designed for rye. The recipes were created based on rye whiskey because that is what it was. So right. I, we encourage you to, you know, rye will be our last one. We're slowly but surely getting there. Um, but when we get to the rye, you know, try cocktails with rye. Even if you feel like you're not a rye, a, a rye drinker of like sipping whiskey, cocktails with rye are really fun. That spice coming through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Hi, Jay. Thanks for joining. Glad we're still here hanging out for you. <laughs> <clears throat> um, let's see. The so we've got the Fort Mose and the, the corn whiskey here is a nice comparison. What do you guys think between the baby blue and the yeah. Fort Mose, since they're technically kind of both dancing around the bourbon corn land. world? They're in corn land. Any preferences? Hi, guys. Hi, Jay. Hey, I was drinking a little bit last night. I, could, I, I couldn't resist. I had to do some prep work. That's okay. Like there's plenty here to, yeah. to take an advanced, uh, you know, foray. Yeah. What did, yeah. what did you learn? What did you like? What did you dislike? Any thoughts? Um, I, I, I did like, oh man, I'm, I'm trying to remember which one it was right now. Um, it, it was a lighter one that actually had a little bit of crisp to it. We have the pork cask. Irish whiskey is pretty light. And probably the baby blue. And probably the, the baby other blue. Balcony. Yeah, it must have been the baby blue then. Yeah, yeah but I had a little sip of each one before I because <laughs> I was looking at it yesterday and I, I was all ready to do the uh the conference tonight or I'm sorry last night and then I was like oh it's not going on <laughs> and I looked at the, the uh, schedule and I'm like oh it's tomorrow so right hey, man you, you can you can dive into these boxes as soon as you get them you know sometimes that's hard to wait yeah Wesley it's a it's a Fort Mose hands down uh versus the baby blue for you huh you need to try them out we do side by side side by side side by side it's really remarkable how people can like just yeah. one or the other. Have you gone so over Evan, how to uh, properly go in and sniff a, a whiskey? We did. Oh, we sure did. Yeah, what's going on over there? Well, did we miss a whole um, whiskey? Because we still have the rye and the twisted hop whiskey left. That's yeah. what we're getting to next. That's next. Doubled, in, doubled and twisted is next. So dive on into that we double. Did. Did we miss the roundstone rye altogether? No, no. That's gonna be last. Oh, maybe yeah, we're yeah, just behind. Last. Yeah, we were just we were just talking about rye. We're 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 keeping you on your toes. Okay. Um, and then, Terry, the the S's, the uh, the procedure, quote unquote, um, site. This one is optional, I would say, with with regard to spirits. Swirl, sniff, sip. And savor. Yeah. And we would even say the, the sniff and swirl can go in either direction. A lot of times it's like I like to sniff it before I swirl it to get a clean, like without any agitation, what do I smell? Then I swirl and then I sniff again. So you can even kind of play in there and get seven in there a little bit with, but the, the swirling is a little bit more with wine and go back and yeah. forth between all five of them, the entire oh, right, time they're right. tasting. Yeah, frankly. So yeah. I, I, can, can you talk a little bit about the water opening it up? I mean, I've been hearing that for years. Sure. Um, of course. You know, how much water does it do all whiskeys? Uh, yeah. What? yeah, so. 
the, I would say that there's a reason we use a dropper. There's a reason we use a dropper. There's a reason that you want to use distilled water, if at all possible, uh, bottled purified water, if not tap water as a very much of a last resort. Um, there are some, there are some um, distillers who actually sell bottles of water that is the same <clears throat> they use to make the whiskey which go along with the whiskey because it's so important. Wow. Because, I mean, if you think about it, whiskey is like what, 80%, I mean, whatever it's- 60%. 60%, I mean, it's 60% water. At a, at a minimum. Yeah. And so it maximum, really can impact, it's just like New York and the bagels, right? Like it can really impact sure. the flavor profile, what minerals are in it. What, and this is one of the reasons also why bourbon is sweet. There's limestone in, in them there hills. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's limestone in, in the shelf, in, in yeah. the table. In, in the Kentucky uh, is very well known for a couple of things. One of them is bourbon, but the other one is bluegrass. And the bluegrass that grows reason. there no. is a perfect uh, source of energy for the horses that run in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. And one of the reasons that it thrives there is because the water that's used to uh, you know, grow the, the bluegrass is filtered through limestone. And limestone removes a lot of impurities. In particular, mm -hmm. with regard to the production of whiskey, it removes iron. And the removal of iron through filtration in limestone really helps to enhance sweetness. It removes kind of this metallic tinge that you will find the same way, you know, if you get a prick on your thumb and you suck your thumb, no. it has that metallic characteristic. But to Suzanne's point, um, yeah, the water source is hugely important. And McAllen is one of the most well-known ones that I know of that they actually sell their cast strength scotch in a side by side bottling. So it's a, you know, it's like 150, 160 proof Scotch whiskey, but then they have a, bottle, uh, a liter of their McAllen Springs spring water. So you double, can proof it down. You know, sold in a double pack. So you can proof it down to whatever amount you like. And Gus, to get back to your question, one of the main things that happens when you add a drop or two is you disrupt the surface tension, but you also disrupt the um, the vapor pressure of the the constituents right there at the top. Um, so Suzanne was mentioning that when the whiskey has just been sitting there, and you go to take a sniff, it can be very different from if you pick it up and swirl it around. And what happens is the volatile aromas, if it's been sitting there a while, they kind of waft right out of the glass the less volatile aromas sit right on the surface of the whiskey. But does the flavor dramatically change or is it just? It can, <clears throat> it, I think it can. You know, it's like when I, when I, decan I when I've decanted wine, the taste has been dramatically different. I mean, does, and, and I, think I expect it, maybe and some to be dramatically different? Yeah, I think it can, but that's one of the reasons we actually use a dropper because we would recommend like adding one drop, giving it another taste, adding two drops. You can use a little spoon to do it too. Adding two or three drops, adding four. And at a certain point, at a certain point, you're going to kind of break the whiskey and it's going to be too much water for the whiskey and it's just going to taste like water yeah. down whiskey. Mm -hmm. So you want to do it slowly, but it especially can really dramatically change the flavor profile, I think, of high proof whiskeys. Um, because sometimes those high proof whiskeys, all you're getting is that burn and you can't really get past the burn. And so yeah. it allows those it flavors the flavor. to come through. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's with, and some of these, these last few are higher proof. And so, you know, playing around with that and, you know, there's whiskey purists out there who are very much like, you should only drink whiskey straight. You're not a real whiskey lover. If you don't drink whiskey straight, that's bullshit. It is just complete and utter bullshit. And that's just like, they're snobs, you know, and they're missing out on a big element of it. So you play around with it and it can change the flavor quite a bit, I think. Like there are some whiskeys that I'm like, I don't really like this. And then I add a couple drops of water and I'm like, oh damn, that's good. Like, yeah. And ice too. Ice can make a big difference. We would suggest if you're going to play with ice, drop the ice in for a minute swirl it around and then pull that ice cube back out you want it to drop the temperature a little bit you want it to add a little bit of water but you don't want it to like water it down yeah you don't know what the ice cube fully melts in yeah there. or use a really big rock now something that i would i would add to that um is that 
because of the way that the water sits, those first couple drops, the way it sits on the surface of the whiskey, at least initially, it really can kind of break that, that surface, surface tension, tension and the vapor pressure. And what I feel like it does for me is the aromas that you'll get off of the glass, they might be sitting there kind of condensed like this and a couple of drops of water will just open them up. It will just spread them out and they'll be a little bit more staggered. And I feel like your nose can be a little bit more adept at finding them. Finding them because you, yeah. instead of trying to find them in this much space, you're finding them in this much space. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it not only changes the flavor, it changes the aroma as well. Yeah. And, and for me, I feel like one of the main reasons I like adding water is because of that expansion oh, of the profile. Yeah. No, that one didn't even smell hot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you, I heard someone back there say it's hot. If it's hot, add a little more water, add a little bit of ice. That's yeah. the perfect time to do that. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah, so I always add a little bit of uh, water if it's like a super high proof. I like my proof around, uh, what, 100 or something? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah and I, think, I don't think any of these are over 100, Jay. Yeah, yeah I don't think so. I think yeah, I always, I always enjoy like the um, under, fit, uh, under 100 proof yeah. uh, whiskeys. After that, it starts to like hit you right there and not let go. And you know, the people question sometimes like, why are some of them so hot? It's like, you can't even taste it. The reason why distillers choose to do bottle or barrel strength and, you know, kind of whiskeys that are like really like high proof is because essentially they want you to be able to play with it, to get it to exactly where you want it for your palate. And also because higher proof whiskeys tend to perform better in cocktails. They show up a little bit more in cocktails. They don't get lost with the other flavors in there. So if you have a really high proof whiskey, try it out in cocktails. But then also the distillers want you to proof it down. They want you to play with it and get it to exactly where you want. Because if they proof it down for you, you can't proof it back up. You can't get it back up uh, to a higher proof, right? So there is a trend going on right now with distillers really like releasing some things at much higher proofs than they used to. Yeah. So this next question sets us up very nicely for, Indeed. I, I, I guess I kind of planned that, but the timing worked out well. Um, so yeah, all whiskey starts as wort um, and wort is really the yeast, the water and the grain. That all mixed together is called the wort, right? I think that's right. <laughs> yeast wort, uh, it should be bread. It's, it's fermented though. Yeah, once well, it's, it's fermented, the yeast starts right. to ferment it, of yeah. course. Yeah, so the, that fermented. And so really what that is, when you have yeast and water and grain, barley, primarily often, fermented, that's beer. <clears throat> um, and so really all whiskey technically starts as beer. Now, the difference is, is a lot of whiskey st starts as very unfinished beer, a beer you would never want to drink. There's it has no, no hops, hop. it has no filtered. barrel aging, it has no filtration. It would just be like the most rudimentary, like way back in the day what beer was kind of thing that just didn't taste very good. And arguably, beer and dough are pretty much the same thing. It's just fermentation or, you know, the rising of the dough, which is frankly fermentation as well. Yeah, very close. It's really just the ratio of grain to water, I guess, between dough and beer. Yeah, and so Charbet Distillery, um, and full disclosure, they are a client of ours. They've been a client for a little while now, um, but they weren't when I originally discovered them, actually. Um, and so they actually really, all of their whiskeys, they make them from finished beer. So they partner with um, Bear Republic. Um, Bear Republic Brewing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm blinking. Bear Republic Brewing. And if you've heard of Racer 5 beer, our Racer 5 is a very popular IPA, especially in Northern California. Um, a it's a very well-known brewery, but they basically take kegs of their Racer 5 beer, their Big Bear Stout, their beers, and then they distill it. And so Marco's, uh, the distiller there, his, his belief is, you know, distillation, what that's doing, distillation, is it's just concentrating your original ingredients. Right. So if you're starting with something that you wouldn't really drink and concentrating that flavor, that's not making something as good as if you start with something delicious that you would drink and then concentrating that flavor. And so that's his philosophy. Good in, it. good out. Exactly. So that's his philosophy behind all of these. Doubled and Twisted is um, a blend of three different whiskeys, essentially. So it is a, um, it's their Big Bear Stout whiskey. Um, so they make it 
from a stout beer, essentially. It's the also Pilsner, right? their Pilsner whiskey. So one of their Pilsners that they turn into a, a whiskey and then a basically a single malt whiskey. Um, and they barrel age those for, I think, at least four years, each one of them. Right. And then they blend them. And this, before they were even, this has been my favorite whiskey <laughs> since I founded the Crafty Cask. I continue to try lots of whiskeys. It lives in my decanter. I've turned lots of people onto it. I just, I love this whiskey. She's gushing. She's, she's glowing. I'm biased. I'm biased. <laughs> I'm totally biased. But I'm really excited because for years I've been doing this with the Crafty Cask and talking about Doubled and Twisted and telling people about it. And this is the first time we've gotten it in a kit and we've been able to send it out to you. It's very true. So we are so excited that we get all of you to try my favorite whiskey Here, of all time. You should cheers with that because that's your jam. Cheers. I mean, I like it too. Yay. <laughs> so yeah. I'd, love to, I'd love to know what you guys think of this because I love it. <clears throat> mm, I just think it's like chocolatey. I, that, that, that's all I, I just get chocolatey. Yeah, that okay, well, stout malt really comes through. Love that. Bought two bottles of it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I your know. dad bought two bottles of it. <laughs> I was uh, I watched a documentary about Scotch, and they talked about how clear, um, clear whiskey has become sort of a thing because the American palate just associates clear with uh, purity. Um, and so I was told that like you can get whiskeys that are cloudy, but I've never seen a cloudy whiskey at all. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, you know, it's it's something that is pretty uncommon because of the general American perception of what that means uh, particularly with beverages things that are translucent fully <laughs> pardon me um they're just kind of seen as something they're flawed there's something wrong with it is what people think right right yeah exactly um but in actuality at least with regard to distillation um and i would say in many ways uh, with wine production as well, um, the lack of filtration that allows for a completely like translucent and and not I'm not not necessarily clear but not opaque not cloudy um, is stripping out a lot of the vital flavors and characteristics fatty acids esters aldehydes that contribute a lot and more and more at least in the craft world. Yeah they're kind of eschewing the idea of filtration to the point of translucency especially chill filtration right yeah um and 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 chill filtration is probably the the most egregious with regard to stripping things out you can generally tell if your uh, craft beverage has been chill filtered <laughs> below a certain temperature so i think it's around if it's 90 proof then below like 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll start to see like flocculation and, and trend. Start to and, separate and, a little bit. Like, kind of, yeah. The same way if you like add an ice cube to, to absinthe or to yeah. um, something like uh, Sambuca, you'll, you'll, it'll instantly turn cloudy. Um, it's a combination of the particulate and like what's in, or in suspension as well as the temperature. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a cool way to check. And, and I definitely think we, we, definitely agree that lean in when you see something that's cloudy yeah give it a try i mean i remember the first time i saw a hefeweizen and i was like what's wrong yeah. with that beer yeah. same <laughs> idea that's a great comparison that's the way it's supposed to be you wanna you wanna give us the the gaelic term and the oh oh yeah oh yeah this is great um so the current quiz question um regard uh, is with regard to the translation the original phrase from which whiskey derives it's a, a gaelic term uh, irish gaelic i believe scottish gaelic maybe um and it is whiskey beta whiskey beta um and roughly translated that is water of life water of life um you see this term kind of replicated in a lot of other countries aqua vitae in, in many scandinavian countries um eau de vie in France, and you just find that is basically distillation of many different types of fruits, eau de vie, water of life. Uh, burnt water is actually not far off. Um, 
Ardens is burnt water. And for a long period of time, the phrase brandy uh, originated from brandt wine, which was burnt wine. Um, and, you know, the process of distilling is applying heat or fire to any number of types of fermented beverages. Uh, brandy is distilled wine. So you're, you're essentially burning wine to get brandt wine, burnt wine, and that became brandy. Yep. Um, lots of other variations on that. Strong water. Speaking I mean, of brandy, though, Charbet, their, their founding is with brandy. They have a... That's very true. Yeah, Char Charbet is actually a 13 generation dis distillation family going all the way back to Serbia. So they've been doing this for 13 generations. Um, and when they first came over to the States, the first thing they distilled was brandy and it was in 1983. And you can still get this 1983 brandy because they barrel aged it for when did, 25 years, 27 years, something. I think they, well, they only, they bottled it until the first time until yeah. like 2000. Yeah. Or, like, you know. Yeah. So they got burnt water idea. They, and it's quite magical, it's quite good. especially for the holidays. Um, yeah. one last thing about Charbet, and in particular, this double and twisted, because it's Suzanne's favorite, another nod. The current distiller, Suzanne mentioned, his name is Marco. Um, and when he took over from his oh, father, yeah. he basically had to kind of prove himself that yeah, he was ready. Thesis, if you will. Yeah. And um, the doubled and twisted was essentially his, his master's thesis. Yeah. This was him saying, okay, I present this to you. I'm I'm ready to take over the distillery. Yeah, his father basically told him that he had to come up with his own spirit. He had to like distill it. He had to create it, and then his father had to try it. And and until he tried it Sign and signed up. off on it, and now Marco is has taken over the distillery, and it's his his baby now. Pretty cool. So pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, it's fun. All right, moving on to our last one. Will you go grab our sage plant real quick? Because Wes Wesley Wesley said, ah, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm bat butchering <laughs> names. We we just had our first bout of COVID last week and we're still we're still <laughs> struggles a little bit. <laughs> it's like the first drink we've had in weeks. Um, but we have a sage plant and I want to see if I can find the sage in the doubled and twisted because that's really fun. I, I like when other people find things that I haven't thought of before to see if I can find it. Yeah, you leaf. Sure. Or you can bring it out. Um, so our last one is Catoctin Creek. They are from Virginia, and Virginia is really like the home of rye in our country. Virginia, Maryland, that area. Um, they rye is where this is where rye was kind of born in our country, and so they have taken a really historical look at rye, and they are bringing it back. Um, they're trying really hard to say rye is America's spirit. Let's do it the right way. And they are very dedicated to sourcing heirloom kind of rye, working with local farmers. Um, and this is 100% rye. So it's a real spicy, fun one. It's him and his wife who started their distillery. And she is the distiller. She's the scientist in the distiller. She's and very demure. She very does the demure. talking. He's the front man. He's, yep. the, he's the face. But she's the one who's making this beautiful. But Becky is the, is the brains behind the operation. Yeah, we've been to their distillery. We've been to a few of these distilleries. Um, and this is the distiller's edition. So essentially what they do is as they're making their roundstone rye, which is their flagship rye, she every once in a while takes one out of every 10 barrels. Squirrels it away. Inside and says there's Just something about this barrel that I really like what's going on here. And I want to, you know, check it out for a little while. Right. Um, and so every, uh, I, I think they said that it goes every like five or six years, they'll go and collect the ones that they've kind of put aside. Yeah. And you know, pull out their their tools, their equipment, and yeah. compile something. And and if they like it, then they bottle some of it. Yeah, they don't necessarily bottle all of it. Well, and this is so this is single barrel. This is you know this is these are single barrel um, releases, and it's only like we said, it's like one out of every ten barrels that get get the distiller's edition. So it's really fun because it's like not only are they really focused on rye, but this is like the distiller's kind of baby favorite whatever the case may be. Evan's intrigued too. Yeah, very much. We just happen to have Sage sitting around here and we haven't killed it yet. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is a lot of this uh, doubled and twisted that mm. I, I associate with the holidays, with Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and Christmas mm -hmm. meals. And I feel like 
sage is pretty for sure common. and I don't know if that association is just because we often are enjoying it with friends and family around the holidays mm -hmm. but either way yeah that's a good call I can I can find a little bit of that sage in there that is yeah that's fun nice I love that that's so fun mm -hmm. so I feel like um Scott would say that this is his favorite and I kind of remember Becky saying the same thing, but that Scott tends to drink the cast strength more because of what we were talking about and the ability to kind of adjust it. This is 92 proof though. So. Right, it's but the cast strength is- Yeah, hot. Fiery. <clears throat> um, good question, Jay. Do you guys notice before you, sorry. No, it's fine. Do you guys notice the difference between this whiskey and the rest of the whiskeys that we've tried so far? Do you get that like, ooh, spicy, that little like wake you up spiciness going on there? I definitely do. I definitely was like, oh, hello. Mm -hmm. Especially after drinking five other whiskeys for a little while, it's a, it's a departure. And, you know, I, I think that it's really neat because despite the relatively high proof, um, I think this is 92 proof. Yeah. And also the spice com component, um, fun tidbit, brief aside, alcohol increases the perception both of sweetness and of spice. So if you have something that is, you know, 110 proof and it's a little sweet, it'll taste that much sweeter. And if you proof it down by adding some, some water to it, that sweetness won't be as pronounced, which is another reason that they'll, you know, distillers will decide to bottle something at 92 proof as opposed to 80 proof, because that you know, that alcohol enhances the perception, like I said, of sweetness and spice. Uh, so with rye, um, I think it's pretty neat that this is as smooth as it is, yeah, despite is the fact smooth. that it's rye, 100%, and, and 92 it's proof. 92 proof. No, I agree. It is nice and nice and smooth. The color of it, you can really see too, the color is quite, quite a bit darker than the other whiskeys that we have going on here. Yeah, that's very much one that I feel like it's important to chew a little bit and get yeah. some saliva in your mouth to kind of protect the spiciness, the spice the and the heat and the heat. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this is one that could be fun to play with water and ice and cocktails, honestly, too. If you want to, if you haven't finished this one and you want to make a little mini old fashioned, this would be or a Manhattan or something like that. That would be fun. So I know we're at time here. We've talked our way through 90 minutes. We've been cooped up all six, so we're excited to talk and we've just fill, filled the space. Charlar, yeah. Charlar, Charlar. <laughs> um, but we are here to answer questions if anyone has them. You wanna show a little preview of the next month's kit since we have it already? Yeah, yeah, of course. And and Jay, I'm happy to hang out and chat a little bit more about whiskey regions. <clears throat> yeah, oh yeah, for sure. We can talk a little bit about that. And if anybody second. else is curious about that. But in the meantime, just briefly, this is our holiday sip scout kit that's coming up. We're very like excited about this. December. Yeah. Um, and this is going to be a mixology kit. So, so this one will be interactive. You'll actually have to get your cocktail shaker out and like mix up some drinks with us. So, and for that, we, we're going to, we're going to really insist. We want to see cameras on because we want to see your shaking <laughs> style. We want to see what your cocktails look like. So look at all the fun goodies in here. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be three cocktails that we're going to be making. Um, and there's going to be enough to make two of each. You've got a ice, a nice mold in there, so you can make make a, make a big cube big for one of your drinks. Sweet ice, uh, ice cube for your drinks. Uh, some fun garnishes, a little stencil. Yeah, we're going to teach fun holiday. We're going to get the inner barista out in you, so you yeah. put a little design on one of your cocktails, make it a little. And, uh, well, yeah, we're really excited about these cocktails. We think that you guys are going to love them. Super stoked to share them with you. We're making one of my favorite kind of while I'm cooking cocktails that I get to sip on that's like not too high ABV, but like very festive and a great one to make up a batch of. So when your guests arrive early and you're still in the kitchen cooking, you can just hand them this drink and it's delicious and festive. Um, some fun, you know, some fun ingredients. We've got some Calvados and some Amaro. Some cider, some dry cider in one of our cocktails. Yeah, we're very excited about this one. Evan's going to get to play mixologist and shake it up for you. And he's great at that. Um, and we'll teach you how to make some cocktails, cocktails and dreams, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Cocktails and dreams. Yeah, we'll make some fun festive cocktails and they're easy enough that you'll be able to make them for your own holiday party or make them for, you know, 
Christmas or Christmas Eve or whatever. Oh no, there's no such thing as Christmas Eve in our family. It's Evan's birthday. That's Evan's right. birthday. <laughs> I can't go. Um, but if anybody has to drop off, we understand. Yeah. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this whiskey. We enjoyed it. Yeah. Hey, aren't you going to talk about Angel's Breath before you sign off? Oh, you want to talk sure. about? We can we can chat about that, and that's actually a great lead into the question that Jay was asking, which is regards to you know regions that are optimal for making whiskey. Angel's Breath or Devil's Share? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Devil's Share yeah, is it the same? Yeah, same same, same idea. Angel. Devil's Cut, Angel's yeah. Envy, uh, Angel's Share. Yeah, lots of different phrases for the same idea. Um, that's a, you know, basically for those of you who are unfamiliar with this idea, it's, it's the lost product during the course of time that, um, you know, your, your, your whiskey is aging. Uh, barrels are watertight or whiskey tight, but they're not airtight. So during the course of the six months, two years, 12 years that the whiskey sits in the barrel, some of it evaporates and, and it evaporates at different rates, the alcohol and the water evaporate at different rates. And so you'll actually lose more water, despite the fact that alcohol is more volatile because water molecules are smaller so they can fit through the narrow, like, you know, water tight gap. Um, the air molecules can fit through there. And so at the um, angels share, the angels, the devil's cut is something that will drastically influence how the whiskey ages and how quickly the whiskey ages, which leads back to Jay's question. Um, right, because temperature fluctuations, right? Precisely. Because essentially what you want to think about is the wood, it sucks the whiskey in kind of, and then it pushes it back out and it sucks it in and it put in the more it does that, A, the more flavor that you're kind of extracting from the wood, but also the higher rate of evaporation that that's happening, right? And right. So is it, the greater the fluctuation in temperature, the more that's happening? Yeah, well, it's a combination. It's, you know, it's not only the fluctuation in temperature uh, from day to night, but also from summer to winter. Right. So if you're in a, a, in a climate that's very humid, it might be quite hot, but because it's humid, it's probably not fluctuating dramatically right. from day to night or from summer to winter. Whereas a more arid environment, it might be, really, you know, you, you can see 50 degree temperature swings during certain times of sure. the year, depending on the location that you're in. So Jay, to, to answer your question, uh, in, in, in short, it really depends on the type of whiskey you're trying to make. If you're trying to make a whiskey where you're extracting a lot of flavor from the wood that whiskey is aging in, it behooves you to be in a place where the temperature is fluctuating you can obviously artificially do this by heating and cooling the warehouse where your barrels are aging, but that becomes expensive. Um, it's a lot easier to have, you know, mother nature take care of that for you. Right. Uh, by contrast, if you're trying to produce a whiskey that is a little bit more restrained with regard to the influence of the oak, then having a, you know, an environment that is a little bit more temperate and doesn't have that fluctuation is, is, Really important. Now, this is kind of putting the cart before the horse because there's also the element of like location with regard to the grain that you're using. Now, and the water source. And the water source, yeah. Uh, the the region that you're in, you know, obviously making water from or making whiskey from tap water is not optimal. Um, we talked a little bit about how the limestone uh, under deposits in Kentucky help filter the water. There's other places in the country where that you find. Um, limestone deposits and the water that be, is being filtered the same way. There's also plenty of places that have natural spring water, which is very pure and very clean. Um, the grain component, there are very few producers of whiskey that have anything to do with the growing of the grain that they use. So with regard to regionality and the same way, like having a vineyard site that grows very good grapes because right. of certain elements of the topography and the soil and the sun exposure and the precipitation. You don't really see that as much of a direct translation with whiskey. Um, the grain that is being used to make whiskey is more of a commodity, I would say, than it's something that you can be very precise with. Now, that's not to say that all of them aren't, 
because gosh, um, Brownstone Rye, uh, the, the sure. uh, Catoctin Creek, uh, Scott and Becky, they really are very much focused on rye that is exclusively grown in Northern Virginia. They're not getting rye from all over, no. you know, New England and into the Midwest. Um, and again, also with the baby blue, like this is Texas, Texas corn. blue corn. No. Um, there, but there are like maybe like a handful of examples off the top of my head, and I might be stretching to say a handful of producers that are making what you might call estate whiskey. Um, yeah. Cool. There's a producer in Nevada called Frey that I think grows all of their grain. Oh. Um, I mean, it's that's a hard thing, right? It's like, really I mean, hard all though. All of a sudden you're a farmer and you're a distiller right. and you're like, that's a, it's, it's very hard to do. It's hard to just distill and it's hard to just farm. Who wants to do both of those? Yeah. The, the other interesting thing is um, agitation mm, or mm -hmm. like there's other elements with aging that can lead yeah. to angel share, devil's cut, you know, all that kind of stuff at different rates at different things. So there are some distilleries who actually send their barrels out to sea. And so they go out to sea and they're on the ocean and they believe that that creates a better whiskey, a different whiskey, some melon. There's a distillery in Northern California that puts headphones on their barrels, like big bows yeah. on their barrels. And they have one barrel without any headphones and another barrel, like it's a control experiment, another barrel with headphones on it. And they have all different controls. They have lots of these. One is listening to Snoop Dogg 24 seven. One is listening to the Nutcracker playlist 24 seven. One's Led Zeppelin. One is listening to Led Zeppelin 24 seven. Oh. And then they bottle them <laughs> and they do blind side-by-side -side tastings and hands down every time they do this, the music barrels beat out the non-music barrels every time. And nothing else is different. Like it's fascinating. Like there, there's all these like weird things going on out there. There's also like different barrel age. Yeah, finished in cedar barrels. People are starting to play with different uh, woods. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but back, back, to, back to Angel's Breast. It is the, <laughs> it's the whiskey maker's gift Angel's to the gods. So, exactly. Yeah, that's the sentiment. Basically. It's either you made a deal with the devil to make your whiskey or you're sacrificing or something to the, to the angels. Or, to make your whiskey. A greater force, a greater force is getting its share. <laughs> yes, exactly 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 but yeah jay that's a great point you know the the use of oak as kind of the predominant standard bearer uh in in aging not just for whiskey but for wine for beer um is something that developed slowly and gradually over many years and i am under the impression that for the most part, nowadays, the use of oak is because that is the most commonly appreciated and most broadly accepted flavor profile, uh, like imbuement that you'll get. Um, the flavor profile from any hardwood, though, I mean, any hardwood is an option for aging, maybe not elm. But do you know of any, do you know of any brands that have like, I don't know, walnut or... <laughs> I don't, I don't know what other hardwoods do. Are there some whiskeys that tout other wood barrels? They're starting to experiment with them. Taylor Garrett is one who's starting to experiment with yep. them. Um, there's in the chat there. Jay put one in there. Uh, it's a Japanese, Japanese whiskey. Japanese whiskey that's doing cedar. Oh. Cedar is very common in Japan. Um, acacia wood is um, been seen more frequently. But yeah, walnut, cherry. Um, uh, what are some other ones? I wonder if uh, juniper would work well with gin. I can imagine that that would work quite well with gin. Yeah. yeah. For bar and barrel aged gins are getting hot. That's that's a burgeoning category for sure. Yeah. I mean, oak oak barrel aging is really something that has only kind of developed in the last two hundred years. Um, a couple centuries ago, people just used whatever hardwood was plentiful. In California, wine was made and aged in redwood. For a very long time, because that's what was there. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of exciting innovation going on in this space for sure. There's um, if you're interested in learning a little bit about accelerated aging, Evan wrote an amazing article. He actually went and met up with his his high school science professor. Um, <laughs> 
and learned all about like the accelerated aging technique before talking to this distillery. And they have, he, they have like a black box approach to like accelerated aging essentially. So they're, they're aging things in what, 13 days, 12 days, 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. And they, no. and they're, and they're sacrilege. sacrilege. We have some, we have some, I don't know. They, they drink pretty well. Now, if we tell you in advance, that's what your reaction is going to be. If we blind taste you on them and just say like, do you like this whiskey? It's going to be a different reaction. It's, um, yeah. People, it's are, people are mentally biased against it, but it's, it's pretty compelling and it's an interesting place to explore for sure. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see, see where the world goes. All hey, right. Thanks, you guys. I guess we'll sign off and let you relax now. Yeah, this is the most activity we've had in a week and a half. So we're <laughs> the most <laughs> what? Activity. Oh, yeah, the most activity we've had we, since we were sick. Whew! <laughs> Ready for bed. Thank you for joining us, though. We had we had such a good time, and we hope you enjoyed it as well. And we'll see you Thanks hopefully next here. month to make some cocktails. Oh, All right. Good half. Thank you. Good night, all. Bye, everyone. Good night. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, is it is going actually going to be one of my questions about like the uh, uh, how, how to how how in this modern day and age could you speed up the whiskey making process? And so, go I, go I, check out and read that article that Evan wrote on our website. It's Taylor Garrett. If you just search Taylor Garrett on our website, and I didn't it's pretty fascinating. I didn't nerd out on it too much because oh, I wanted to. I mean, I had one paragraph of like real chemistry nerd out, but. Yeah, uh, go read it. And if you have if you have further questions, Jay, feel free. I'd be happy to kind of share more of my my thoughts and my like suspicions. Um, uh -huh.